back to the Empowered Podcast. My name is Emily Arth. I'm a psychotherapist, educator, and creator. And you are logging into a special series called The Healers Guild, in which I am bringing you an eclectic variety of healers who are speaking about how their specific modality can be used to help you overcome difficulties in your life. So today I'm super excited to have Joy Willenbrink Conte with us, who is a music therapist and lecturer of music therapy at the University of Dayton. In this role, Joy supervises preclinical training and teaches music therapy degree courses. Her clinical experience is centered in mental health care of all ages, specifically addiction, trauma, and grief recovery. Joy's scholarship explores the nature of women-only therapy groups, body-oriented, and strengths-based treatment approaches. Be on the lookout for her forthcoming co-authored book, Music Therapy with Women with Addictions, written in collaboration with music therapist, educator, and scholar, Susan Gardstrom. So welcome, Joy. Thank you for being here today. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Most definitely. So I'm excited for you to tell us a little bit about your background and how you like learned about music therapy and decided to choose this as a path for your profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I first actually heard about music therapy when I was, um, in high school and (laughs) funny enough, um, I don't know if this is actually helpful for many people, but I, I took one of those personality surveys that gives you all these job, (laughs) generates all these, you know, potential job um, ideas, career paths, and um, music therapy was on there. And I I had no idea what that profession involved, what that was. Um, And so that kind of prompted me to reach out to some music therapists back when I was a high school student. And I just found that uh, I I anticipated, I suppose, that this career path would combine some some uh, values of mine. So I always really valued music. And for me, it was a really uh, essential part of my own development and kind of finding my voice and building up my sense of self. Uh, and so I, I loved the idea of that continuing to be part of my life. And um, I knew I wanted to work with people in some capacity and really um, just be, yeah, be engaged in you know, in community with other people and um, working alongside other people. So, um, it you know, I felt fortunate that throughout my training in school, um, the the profession, the idea of the profession continued to align with my sense of self and my values. Um, and so I, I studied actually where I'm teaching now at the University of Dayton. Um, and then Um, I completed an internship, which is part of the music therapy training process in uh, New Orleans at a a mental health um, treatment center that really served folks with pretty diverse needs. Um, There was an eating disorder treatment unit, trauma, a specialized trauma treatment unit, um, addictions care, um, teen and and childhood um, care, um, as well as more general mental health support for folks who had recently experienced a crisis of some sort. Uh, And and then after that, um, went on to work um, with you, Emily, at um, Fulton State Hospital with folks with really chronic mental illness. Um, And there, I really think I found um, this sense of how powerful music therapy could be, especially for folks who are just difficult to reach, I think, and difficult to connect with. Um, And that started to highlight for me the importance of just supporting folks and finding music therapy, finding music as like a resource, (laughs) you know, something that connects them to their, their strengths and their humanity versus just merely a focus on illness or, you know, parts of themselves that are pathologized, you know, that need to change. And so really helping, um, helping connect with those resources. Um, yeah. And, and I went on to grad school, um, outside of the Philadelphia area and continued to work, um, in primarily inpatient mental health settings, um, mostly with adults, um, and really started to hone in on my interest in supporting folks in addictions, treatment recovery, and related to that trauma 
recovery um, and, and really come to recognize how pervasive trauma is in our world. And, um, you know, really, I believe that trauma informed care and, and a focus on trauma recovery is probably relevant in most, um, you know, intensive <laughs> treatment settings. Um, you know, when folks arrive in an inpatient hospital, I think, you know, it's almost 100% of them have experienced some sort of trauma. Um, and, and, you know, really learning what music therapy meant means as a resource in, in that context. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then flash forward to now, I'm, I'm teaching um, and still trying to continue some clinical work of my own so that I can stay in touch with the field and be a good educator of music therapy. Um, and so I work with undergrad students and, and supervise some of their clinical work as well as teach some courses in the traditional classroom. Wonderful. So you've had quite an evolution over the years and been in a lot of different settings, which is exciting. You bring a lot of background to this discussion. So I'm wondering for people who are not familiar with music therapy or have just kind of heard of music therapy, but functionally don't really know what does music therapy look like? You know, what can people expect when they participate in music therapy? Can you give people kind of a picture of what that looks like? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, so, so music therapy, to give just a general definition, you know, it's, it's a therapy process um, and it really relies on music and engagement and music experiences and the therapeutic relationship. And um, together, you know, those are kind of the agents with the client, you know, that that's the source of, um, of change, right, in, in the process. And um, so I like to um, rely on these four categories of music therapy experiences, um, just to give folks a sense of what, what, what it might look like in a typical session or a group context. Um, so we might receive music in some way. So listening to music and moving, creating art, um, listening to music and reflecting on the song um, quality, the music quality, the lyrics, and using that as a way of building some self insight, um, you know, taking in music and relaxing. And so there's all kinds of ways that we can really absorb music and then um, respond in some way. Um, that's, that can be really therapeutic. Uh, we also, music therapists, might create music with folks they work with. So um, improvising, which is spontaneously creating music, um, it's, it can be a really playful process, a way of tapping into to one's, um, just exactly tapping into what's going on inside without filtering through, you know, words or a more cognitive process. Um, it can be a way to explore creativity, um, to, to kind of return to some, some things that we do really naturally in childhood um, later in life. And so um, improvisation is one method, one, one category of music experiences. Um, we might also compose music or compose elements of music. So writing, lyrics to, to sing or to rap, um, to tell your story, um, transforming a song that already exists, but maybe altering it in some way to, to align with something that you need to express or that, that a group comes together to express. Um, and, and lastly, we might recreate music that already exists out there in the world. So putting your own voice or your own body um, into some music and um, and, and really um, being involved in that creative process. So um, yeah, so, so music therapists kind of draw from all of those different um, ways of working and, and work with folks across the age spectrum um, with really different needs and really different strengths um, that they bring to, to the music therapy space. Excellent. So yeah, that gives me a much clearer picture of like what I might be doing mm -hmm. if I was participating in music therapy. Um, in terms of trauma treatment, what do we know about how music therapy fits into treating trauma and like how it benefits or why it benefits people with that type of background? Right. Yeah. So um you know, in many ways, um, music therapy is a relatively young field. And so um, we're finally 
really digging into and, and um, you know, putting out our own resources about the many benefits of music therapy and support of trauma recovery. But I also look to other um, experts in the field of trauma recovery. So like Bessel van der Kolk, um, Peter Levine, Linda Curran and her EMDR work. There's lots of um, theorists and clinicians out there who really have, have um, advocated the need for body-oriented or somatic uh, approaches to treating trauma. That, you know, they say and, and argue that trauma is really stored in our physical selves, um, as well as, you know, it, it's maybe stored in our minds, but it's, it's really stored in the body and it affects the, the whole self, the spirit, the mind, and the body. And so music therapy is really well positioned, I think, then to treat trauma because it is an experiential therapy by nature, right? So no matter what you're doing in music therapy, you're some way, you're in some ways involved in that experiential process of creating music, or your body is absorbing the music. Um, and so it can, I think, create this, this pathway that doesn't necessarily have to rely on verbal processes that sometimes are not um, adequately they're not really there in a way to make sense of the trauma sometimes, right? It's just stored in this in the somatic level. And so uh, music therapy can really get in and help to, um, to kind of work through those, those somatic blockages and increase insight about what's going on in the body and, um, and thus support recovery really from a ground up um, kind of way. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's um, a music therapist, Diane Austin, who has created this model of music therapy, uh, vocal psychotherapy. And her work is really with, um, primarily with folks with co complex trauma and complex PTSD, early developmental forms of trauma. And she, she writes and um, talks about how singing, right, this process of connecting with your breath as you sing, that that process can really help to release these, these blockages that get formed um, when we experience trauma, particularly repeated trauma early in life that, you know, in some ways inhibits this development of sense of self. And so through the process of vocalizing in a really supportive relationship, um, a trusting, safe relationship, that you can start to deteriorate some of those barriers um, and be able to work with that really raw, you know, material that maybe hasn't been able to be accessed. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so I, you know, I think the field is, is um, has some work to do to continue to explore, um, you know, and provide some some really hard evidence, you know, that, that says why and how this works. Um, but we have lots of of clinicians and um, and folks who have participated in music therapy who bring that you know that expertise from experience that say yeah this is why this works because it, it connects the body mind and spirit in the process yeah I like what you said about how it's well positioned um, for this particular issue because you know, there are many ways in, like you said, we know that the issues are stored in the tissues with trauma. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in my experience, at least in psychotherapy, some people um, subconsciously are able to release those physical restrictions by starting with the brain and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, but likewise, there may even in the same person be other experiences that are not able to be accessed from, you know, going through the brain, so to speak, that maybe we need to do something like craniosacral therapy or movement therapy or music therapy that can really uh, actively engage the body directly to release the restriction. And mm -hmm. so the beautiful thing about music is that, like you said, there's this somatic component to it. But also, depending on the intervention you're using, there can also be a narrative storytelling component to it. So you can be kind of attacking it from both directions. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's a good point. You know, I mean, I think if we know anything, it's that each person, you know, also 
um, the impacts of trauma are really unique and individualized. And, and so thus, like you said, the, the treatment um, and recovery process is going to look different for different people. And so, yeah, I think having those different pathways and avenues available is, is indeed really important. Um, yeah, so I, I've certainly experienced that too, right? For some of us, it's, it's more vulnerable to be in our bodies and, and that might be a, a scary place to begin in therapy and uh, vice versa. For some of us, it's more vulnerable to be up in our heads and, and you know, engaging in a more verbal process early on. And so just having the capacity to, to flex based on, you know, the individual's own resources and capacities is, is essential. Yeah, I, I think, like you said, it totally depends on the person, how they feel most comfortable entering. But we tend to live in a pretty cognitively based society, a pretty heady society. So I'm interested if you would share, how do you see vulnerability show up in music therapy around maybe moving out of that more like, why am I doing this into more of an intuitive flow space? You know, mm -hmm. what kind of like resistance do you see come up around that? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. I think, you know, in my work with adults in particular, it's often, I think, safer for folks to start in this verbal space, right? It's the way we function. Whereas being in a more spontaneous, playful, um, music-centered space really feels threatening and vulnerable. And so I think, um, you know, in that case, just treading lightly and, and really slowly starting to introduce um, music making and, and music processes kind of coupled with that more cognitive <laughs> or verbal space. Um, I, I should also mention, I, I don't think I said this earlier, but music therapy, uh, to engage as a participant in music therapy, you do not need any background in music, right? It's, it's really accessible to everyone. Um, the music therapist in me says we all, you know, are musicians, we all have that capacity. And, and sometimes it gets shut down in us from a really early age. And, and some people actually have a lot of baggage that they carry into music therapy related to feeling, you know, like a, a, a bad singer or, you know, I have a terrible voice, I, how could I sing, right? And so it takes a lot of time to really um, break down, again, some of those resistances in a, in a steady, gentle sort of way. Um, so yeah, the trusting relationship I think helps. Um, I've also, you know, been so privileged to work in group settings and I find there's something really powerful about, um, you know, witnessing a group come together and, and slowly start to take risks together and, and, you know, see their peers perhaps take a risk putting their voice out there or their music out there and it being accepted and, and welcomed by the group. And I think that process for me as a facilitator is really moving because, um, you know, the, the group is really doing so much to help kind of mend and repair um, the harm that's been done in other relationships just by accepting, you know, the authentic voices of the, of the group members. And, and so we can slowly kind of move into that more, more body oriented or a more music centered way of, of working that um, perhaps, you know, can, can enable healing in a different sort of space in the self. Definitely. So I hear you saying that just the practice of showing up to music therapy in and of itself is an exercise in vulnerability and moving us closer into our authenticity if we can have like that trusting space with our therapist. Yes, I think so. I, I think especially for adults, you know, children, teens, <laughs> they tend to, in some ways it's the reverse, right? They might enter into a music space with much less inhibition and, and in some ways music making can I think mirror more natural forms of communication for kids um, like play but I think certainly you're right just showing up is a big deal um, for for adults especially when yeah when that that music creative space is really unfamiliar territory yeah, and I like what you highlighted about the group work too, because of course, one of the things that I work a lot with is shame resilience. And we say that the antidote to shame is empathy. 
And so that's why we have to learn to speak shame, um, right? Or act it out, communicate it in some way, because if we don't communicate it, then we don't open up to someone else saying, I see you, I understand you, I felt that same way. Mm -hmm. And when we receive that, shame can't survive. And so when you're in a group, I think, like you said, just by being part of a group and just by participating, you witness other people's shame as well as their courage and speaking up or singing or acting out or whatever it is that you're doing. And then you also witness the safety that the group creates around that. And then we say that courage is contagious. So then, you know, we have more people who are willing to give it a try, like you said. And within the safety of that container, healing can take place because we're opening up to receiving that empathy and that compassion. Yeah, yeah. What a beautiful process, right? To be part of, yeah. And a natural process, one that... Our society that's focused on this hyper individualism, you know, this illusion that we're supposed to be doing everything on our own, like that gets in the way of this natural communal process mm -hmm. of being witnessed by other people and loved and celebrated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, it, it, you know, connecting that to music making, there are so many cultures throughout this world where community music making is just a part of life, right? People are making music and, and connecting with others really regularly. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe there's less need in that context for music therapy because people already have those resources built into their routines. But I, I think you're right here in the, in, in the U.S., you know, music making is kind of reserved for some elite professionals and, and we don't have as many of these opportunities as naturally to just come together and be, you know, in connection with other people and in a creative process. And so, yeah, finding, finding opportunities for that um, is really special and, and maybe encourages people to find other sources of that, that connection, you know, um, in, their, in their daily life because of its value. Right. Yeah, I was in a discussion group a few months ago with people in all different generations and we were the discussion topic was music that changed our lives. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of fun. But in that discussion, we started talking about the evolution of how we have shared music in this society. And of course, right now, during the time of COVID, we're like more restricted than we've ever been because we can't even have festivals or concerts. Mm -hmm. um, but they were saying that, you know, like in my parents' generation, for example, when a new record would come out, it was a common practice to get your friends together and to listen, you know, to that front to back together and to share that as a communal experience and discuss it. And, you know, now we've moved to this very like headphones culture where we're just individually listening to our music. And then even more, I was thinking, you know, when's the last time that I listened to a whole album and really honored the story of the album versus just picking and choosing songs? Yeah. Yeah, it really is a different, you know, a different time. I think you're right for for engaging with music and, yeah, and sharing it maybe with with people, I think. There's so much music out there and it's, it's increasingly accessible, which is awesome. But yeah, our preferences then can be so distinct um, and we might have less overlap with, with people. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's something that's pretty common in music therapy, honestly, is just to bring um, for folks, participants to bring music that's really meaningful to them that maybe communicates something about themselves and just to share that with um, their peers, with their therapist, with peer group members, can be a really therapeutic process and also so refreshing to just connect with some music that maybe, you know, would not have been something you would have ever chosen to listen to, but, you know, you could still find value in that music or at least in the person's communicative process in sharing. Exactly. Well, yeah, and, and that's something else I was thinking in this time of increasing intolerance for differences, right. how just that exercise of coming together and sharing, whether it's music or art or anything really that you love, um, you know, trauma impacts us in that it lowers our distress tolerance. 
So when things irritate us or when things are not perfectly in alignment with what we love, we become less tolerant of those things. Mm -hmm. And so just having these exercises where we sit with someone, like you said, and maybe the song that you chose for us to listen to is not my favorite song and I would never choose it. But that alone is an exercise in learning how to tolerate and also appreciate differences and, mm -hmm. and learn that even if I don't like it, I'm taking my relationship with you deeper because I'm seeing a part of you now that I didn't see before. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. To witness, to witness that and just to be there and be present. And, you know, I'm, I'm constantly surprised at how many times, yeah, folks are able to say like, wow, you know, I, I, I hate country usually, but this was really powerful. And, you know, I really connected with this, the, you know, the singer's voice or this lyric phrase. And um, yeah, what, a, what an opportunity for, for um, people to step outside their comfort zone, mm -hmm. which, yeah, is really a resilient act, right? Yes. So not to put you on the spot, but I know we all love stories. And I was wondering if you have any stories that you can share that you've witnessed in your work or a story, right? That's been really transformational or inspirational for you. Mm. Yeah, um, certainly. I, yeah, I feel um, constantly inspired, I think, and really um, rejuvenated, I think, by the, the people I'm um, privileged to work with. Um, yeah, so I, I have something that, that comes to mind. So in my, my role um, at, at the University of Dayton, I get to supervise students in their preclinical training. And um, one site where students um, go to complete that training is a local residential addictions treatment center. And so in one particular session, we were working with a group of women um, and we, um, we had actually through this, this um, song communication or song sharing process, a, a few sessions prior, a woman had shared um, the song, I'll Find You. It's by Lecrae and Tori Kelly. So she had shared the song and we had listened to it and um, it was meaningful to her. And, and we discussed, you know, other folks had really strong um, connections with the music. And I think it was unfamiliar to many in the group. And so a few sessions later, um, the, the students at this point, so, you know, they really took the lead. I, I was there as a supervisor, but, um, they were really guiding the process and, and they offered the opportunity for the women in this particular group to, um, to transform the verses of the song, to express their own, um, kind of where they were at right now in their, in their process. And just, again, to communicate something. So really a self-expressive platform. And um, this is pretty daunting to a lot of people in the group, right? It's, um, I think, scary to write, to feel like, you know, I can't write a song. I've never done this before. Um, and so there was some initial hesitance. And then the group really said, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's go for it. So um, we spent some time writing and, and the structure that, that we set up was really that, um, each individual in the group, if, if they felt so inclined, they could share their verse aloud. Um, many women wrapped their verse. Some of them, you know, kind of just read it with passion, spoke it with passion. Um, some women kind of added some, some melody, kind of sang their, their verse. And in between each verse, we came and sang the hook, the, the chorus of the song all together. And um, just to feel the energy in the room when that happened, you know, I think there was just this, this swell of momentum that happened as our voices got stronger, you know, by the end we had sung this chorus so many times and it just, it felt richer and deeper each time. And, um, and there was actually one woman in the group who, um, was really having a hard time. She, um, was grieving a loss in her life and, um, you know, she couldn't, felt like she couldn't write anything on that day, which was fine. You know, that's always honored. And just the fact that she was there through that process was really important, I think. And so when it came her turn, you know, she didn't share a verse, but we still offered, can we sing the, the chorus to you? And 
She said, yeah, sure, you know, and the women's voices, again, coming in to support her. And so, you know, while we weren't holding hands or anything like that, you know, you feel, I, I remember just feeling this, um, the strengthening of this network that was happening through this, you know, this process of, of authenticity and, and willingness to be vulnerable. Um, and, and also, of course, this music, musical process, right? Um, and, and yeah, just having your voice be heard in that way. And so um, that's just a really beautiful memory for me for a lot of reasons. I, I remember feeling so privileged to be a part of the group, so proud of the students I was working with for really facilitating such a meaningful process with such care. Um, and yeah, and just inspired by just that, the, the vulnerability, the authenticity displayed by everyone in that space. Wow. So, yeah. What an incredible story. That's beautiful. And yeah. yes, I think for anyone who has not been in a shared space where vulnerability is happening, I totally agree. There is a, an immense power um, in letting out your own authenticity and being witnessed by other people. And especially, like you said, being celebrated, you know, when people give that gift back to you of mirroring. Yes. Um, it's, it's, its own kind of magic for sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, Joy, I so appreciate you making time to be here with us today and sharing the work that you do and sharing the benefits that it can have for anyone who has um, especially trauma in their background, but any difficulties in their life that this is a modality that can help them move through that and heal. So thank you everyone else for joining us today. Um, you can learn more about joy beneath this video. I hope you'll join me again next time on the Healers Guild for more awesome healers. And I'm sending you all abundant love. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you so much for having me and, and letting me uh, speak on this wonderful platform you've created. Most definitely. Be well, everyone. Mm -hmm.